Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here tonight. Uh, welcome out of the wind. A little, little windy out there, but it's nice to be in here in the warmth and with good company. My name is Mark Sargent. I serve as the provost at Westmont College, and it's a pleasure to welcome you to the final one of our Westmont Downtown series. It's been a great series this year. We've had wonderful participation from the community. This is really our gift back to the community, uh, or, or one of our gifts, uh, an opportunity for us to share with you uh, some of the good work and good thinking and um, energy that we get out of our faculty. And uh, they have, faculty members always talk about how much they enjoy interacting with the audience, and uh, we're glad that you showed up and can be part of this. I'm giving my greetings on behalf of the college, but also on behalf of the Westmont Foundation, which uh, is a, um, a, a, a sponsor of this event, and we're grateful for, uh, for their work. Uh, I, d I did want to mention uh, that uh, coming up in June, there is a special event at the uh, a college called the Lead Where You Stand Conference. It's a program on leadership, uh, fantastic lineup. We have uh, some outstanding speakers coming in. Uh, David Brooks, Doris Kearns Goodwin, uh, as well as President Beebe and members of the, the college community. So we're excited about uh, the program. It's going to take place from June 6 to 8. And if you're interested, you can gather more information by going to the website, just westmont.edu slash lead. Uh, westmont.edu slash lead. So I encourage you to look at that. Well, it gives me great pleasure to uh, introduce to you Dr. Carmel Saad who teaches in our psychology department at Westmont. Uh, I think I'm always going to have a special uh, connection with Dr. Saad because we started about the same time. Uh, she's actually the first tenure track faculty member I hired when I came to Westmont. And she just got tenure this year, uh, which was, uh, uh, yeah, congratulations. <laughs> When I say just got tenure, she got tenure in, in the, uh, the, the quickest uh, timetable that you can do, and so she has distinguished herself in her work here. I also have a special connection in that my daughter was a psychology major at Westmont and had her in, in class, and I just know from conversations at home how much my daughter loved being in her classes. And if you get to know Dr. Saad, you know why. She has this kind of warm, outgoing personality, and when she asks you how you're doing, you know she really cares, and that's... Uh, something that uh, is valued by our students and valued by our community. Um, prior to joining uh, Westmont, Dr. Saad completed her undergraduate degree at UC Santa Barbara and then went on to complete both a master's degree and a doctorate at UC Davis where she focused on social and personality psychology with an emphasis in cultural psychology. Now she's done extensive research on biculturalism. As an Egyptian-American, she has concentrated on the influence of cross-cultural travel and study on creativity and cognitive development, as well as on identity formation. Recently, she's developed a new line of research uh, on implicit bias. Both the Santa Barbara uh, Unified School District and the Santa Barbara Police Department have given her grants to help them with training uh, and education regarding addressing implicit bias. Now, when we talk about issues of identity and bias, you can venture into some difficult terrain where it is easy to stir people's passions, uh, provoke them to, into a certain defensiveness, and, and lead them to draw some uh, hasty conclusions or hasty reactions. So what I have seen so often in Carmel's uh, presentations and in, in, in her interactions is her special capacity to speak about these issues in ways that are informative, and empathetic rather than disparaging or condescending. She has the astute, astute intelligence to discern important conclusions from the evidence and has a, a really fine ability to make complex ideas clear. She can be self-reflective, honest about her own uncertainties, and always respectful toward her students and the audience. And she's helped me see that many people who explicitly and openly embrace egalitarian ideals may still carry around some implicit bias towards certain peoples and groups. And yet she does this in a way that illuminates rather than judges. So I am very pleased to share with you and introduce tonight uh, some of that wisdom and winsome spirit. Please welcome Dr. Carmel Saad. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mark, for such a lovely introduction, and thank you to the Westmont Foundation and for all of you for being here. 
Um, it's my honor to be here today to talk about um, a, an area of research that I've done a lot of my work on, both academically and within the community. Um, and so today I'm going to talk to you about these hidden prejudices or implicit biases that really do exert an impact on our work and relationships. Okay, so um, today I'm gonna define what implicit bias is uh, with particular focus on what it is not and how it differs from more overt or conscious uh, biases. Um, I'm gonna talk about how prevalent it is and answer this question using research that addresses does it really impact our behavior? And you'll see that it does. And then I'm gonna end with, well, what are some concrete strategies that we can address this issue, both at the individual level as well as on a systems level? So I wanna start off by just addressing um, what, are, what are the trends since the early 1900s, starting from about 1935 until present day, three years ago, um, in terms of these egalitarian ideals that Mark spoke of. Well, what we can see is that egalitarian attitudes are on the rise in many different areas. So this is same schools, um, people's endorsements that different racial and ethnic groups should share the same schools, that, they, um, that interracial marriage is a good and acceptable thing, and that laws against interracial marriage should be banned. So the higher the scores, the more endorsement of these egalitarian ideals. And as you can see from the graph, from 1935 until present day, people believe in these egalitarian ideals more and more. If we wanna nuance some of these data, we can see that only 4% of Americans supported interracial marriage in 1958. In uh, by 1997, that rose to 50%, and today it is at 87%. Racially motivated hate crimes reported to the FBI fell almost 50% from 1994 to, to, tw to 2015. So this picture tells us that people are consciously or explicitly endorsing more equitable egalitarian ideals Regardless of this, however, we still see disparities in outcomes among different racial groups. So um, I'm gonna go through various sectors, starting with law enforcement. In probation, for example, there's research showing that probation officers attribute the delinquency of black youths to negative attitudinal and personality traits, but white youths to the actions, uh, white youths actions to the influence of his or her social environment. So when they're dealing with the same severity of, of transgression, if you will, they will attribute it or they'll explain it to um, the core of the person's personality if they're a black youth, but say that it must be something in their social environment if it's a white youth. In a different sector of law enforcement, uh, the police, we see that police officers are oftentimes faster to identify images of weapons, like a knife or a gun, as they become depixelated when they're preceded by subliminal or unconscious images of black versus white faces. So subliminal, we, you know, subliminal messages, you've heard about those. In the, la in the research lab, subliminal images mean that they flash too quickly for you to notice what happened, but you, they still get into your psyche. So here's an example. I want you to look at the cross on the screen. Did anyone see what those images that flashed were? It's a head, okay. I'm sorry? Okay, full on face. Actually, both of them were faces. One was a black face and one was a white face. Um, and this is what the participants in the research lab did. They were flashed these faces too quickly for them to notice what it was. And they were either shown the black face or the white face, not both. And for those undergraduate research participants, they then did a task where their job was to see what was in this very fuzzy um, pixelated image. So can anyone tell what's in this image? Yeah, so as it becomes increasingly clear over the frames, 
uh, people were able to identify that it was a gun. So good job for those that were able to do it. I did sort of give you a clue at the beginning where the undergraduates didn't get that. Nonetheless, it's a very blurry image, and it's interesting to note that undergraduates were quicker, so in other words, they took fewer frames to identify that it was a gun when they were first shown the black face, unbeknownst to them, versus the white face. What's even more shocking is that we got the same results with police officers. So researchers have looked at, at officers and they've had the same results. So what does this mean? This means that there is a strong association between African American and criminality in our society. But this is not a talk to accuse anyone of being racist. We all have these tendencies because we all grew up in a society that gave us messages that associate certain groups with certain traits. And so this is more about raising awareness about the messages that are already present in society. Um, going to gender, we see that among these famous symphonies and orchestras, there's a large underrepresentation of women. And some judges suspected that it could be to discriminatory practices. So they decided to do blind auditions in which they had a barrier up so they could hear the person playing but not see who they were. And there was still an underrepresentation of women. And they found out that it was because the judges were reacting to the click clack of the high heels. And so there was auditory implicit bias. And so then they said, everyone take off your shoes and go behind the barrier. And only after that um, did, women, did representation of women increase by 50% after they instituted these blind audition rule. Um, going to the workplace, researchers have also shown that implicit bias affects who gets called back when they send in their resume. So what they found is that, well, what they did is they took identical resumes and they put a stereotypically black sounding name on the resume, Jerome or Latanya, versus a stereotypically white sounding name like Greg or Emily. And they found that the white sounding name resumes got called back 50% more of the time than did the resumes with the black sounding names, even though they were identical resumes. And these were real companies, real organizations that they sent it out to. Even in the medical field, they found that physicians' implicit bias predicts how long they spend with patients and how thoroughly they answer their questions. So they found that physicians with higher levels of this unconscious prejudice, and remember, this is prejudice that they don't know they have, predicted how long they spent with patients, and this was particularly true among oncology doctors, cancer doctors. And you know, it's one thing to, to spend less time, but then the, the black patients walked out of the interaction feeling less confident in their doctor and feeling less confident in the treatment recommendation, which led them to adhere to the medication less than white patients. So this is consequential. Moreover, in emergency rooms, black and Latino patients both receive, on average, lower amounts of painkillers than white patients do, even controlling for the severity of the injury. And they dug a little deeper, and they found that this was because doctors were giving them less medication because of the implicit or unconscious assumption that they might get addicted more quickly than their white patients. Now, let me just remind you, the physicians had no idea that they were doing this. They don't mean to, there's no malintent, but they absorb these messages early from society, from media, family, friends, and it leaks out onto their behavior without them knowing it. So, we, we talk about stereotypes, which are just associations. Um, turns out that our brains are constantly bombarded with lots of different things to pay attention to every day. And so our brains, because they, they only have limited amounts of energy, need desperately any type of shortcut to help them focus and move on. That's the only way that we can function. So stereotypes are associations that save us this precious time and energy. In other words, if, if I meet somebody new and 
it's, I know it's gonna take me time to ask about them and get to know them as a person. If I don't have a lot of time or ability, I might just assume that they're like other people in their group that they look like and move on. Again, I don't know that I'm doing this, but it's my brain's tendency to want to save time and energy because it only has a lim limited amount of each. So stereotypes are learned unintentionally long before we have well-developed values related to race and gender. And they make these associations for us. This group must be like this. That group is like this. So that we don't have to process information. We can streamline the information that comes in. And when I see someone new, I can just assume that they are like this and this and this because their group is like this and this and this. Now, like Mark said, a lot of people become defensive at this idea. But our brains do it not just with people, but with everything else. So if I'm coming to a new venue and I'm giving a talk and here's a new projector, I've never seen anything, I've never seen that particular projector before. But I have seen other projectors and I know what to do with this projector because I'm assuming it's like other projectors that I've seen. That saves me a lot of time and energy over sniffing it and touching it and pressing a whole bunch of buttons. I know that it probably functions in the same way and that allows me to function well in society. So this is a natural tendency for our brains to do. And just to do a little game that we sometimes do in our uh, consulting workshops with Just Communities, which is a local organization around town. Um, so I want you to do this game with me. I want you to complete the word, so it's going to be a word fragment at the bottom of each list. Ready? Insect, balloon, shoe, battery. Terminal? Termite? Okay, that one's kind of hard because these words don't really frame that for you. But let's try another one. Dog, Scottish, Jack, Russell. That one was easier, wasn't it? Now let's try one more. Faith, Muhammad, Mosque, Islamic. Now, why was it that terrier came to mind here, but terrorist came to mind here? Context? Because we associate, we make associations. That's what our brain does. It's a natural process. But the problem is, is that we come across lots of people who may be Muslim, or we come across lots of people who are from a particular group that may or may not be like this trait. So even though it saves us cognitive energy, becoming aware of it allows us to override it and, and to get to know the person better, right, in the situations where it's appropriate. Might not be appropriate with the projector, might be appropriate with people. So um, we tend to, whenever we encounter new stimuli, clump it into these groups that are ready-made for us, given to us by society. We do it with people, just like we do it with objects. New ball, we think that it's probably made for a sport. Shoes, even different types of dogs, we kind of get the sense that dogs are like this, which are different from cats, who are normally like this, right? Even though there's lots of individual differences between various dogs and cats. So um, here's an example with people. So you have four columns of common stereotypes in society. And maybe you don't want to call them out, but I'll just let you know, based on the research, these are the groups that people associate with these traits. Now, just like society gives us clues about objects, they give us clues about people. Now, why do our brains even do this to begin with? Well, scientists think that in an evolutionary context, because it was a precarious context where we needed to look at someone quickly and decide if they were friend or foe, um, stereotypes helped us. Because people who were in my tribe looked like me, and chances are they were going to be friendly. People in a different tribe may have looked different from me, and chances are they would be less likely to be friendly. So because we needed to make these decisions very quickly, our brain became wired to look at people and to make these instant judgments about them. 
Um, for example, scientists have now shown that when you think about yourself, you use a very particular part of the brain called the ventral medial prefrontal cortex. It's just this part of the brain right here behind the forehead um, that you use to think about yourself. Now let's say I meet someone that is, my, that is similar to me. So let's say they're my same political affiliation. Well, I use the same part of my brain to think about them that I do about myself. Let's say I meet someone different from me, different political orientation. I automatically relegate them to a different part of the brain to even do the thinking about them. So imagine if we use different parts of real estate of the brain to even do the thinking about different people, how might this then affect our behavior towards different kinds of people? There was this interesting study done in Italy um, where they wanted to see if people from different backgrounds would respond the same way if various members' hands, various group members' hands were in pain. So in this study, they showed white and black participants um, a video of a hand that was in pain, like into which a doctor's syringe was going into. And they didn't ask them, you know, how aversive do you find this? They tested a fight or flight response. So when we feel aversion towards something, we, f we get a little more sweat on our hands. Not much, but it gets a little more sweaty. And scientists can actually measure that with precision, and that is one physiological indicator of distress. So what they found is that when a white participant saw a white hand in pain, that they produced more sweat than when they saw a black hand in pain. What's even more shocking is that they wanted this control hand, which is like this weird alien violet hand, and they found that white participants produce the most sweat to white hands, followed by this weird violet alien hand, and very last, the black hand. Similarly, black participants produce the most sweat to the black hand, followed by the control violet hand, and very last, the white hand. So if we, if we feel more um, aversion to our own group's pain, might that dictate how much we're moved to empathize with them or help them? Maybe. So the problem with these unconscious biases, even on a bodily level of which we're not aware, is that we're not aware, <laughs> which makes them particularly insidious because they can affect our behavior outside of conscious control. So one of the things that we do in our workshops is to help people become more aware of these biases, to accept that these biases exist, and then to teach them concrete strategies of how to overcome them. So I usually use this image of an iceberg because we think we have complete conscious control over all of our behavior, but really that's just the tip of the iceberg. There is a whole section that is submerged underwater that is the unconscious that predicts most of our behavior, or at least certain important pieces of our behavior as well. So the problem with implicit bias is we don't know we have them, we don't know what they are, and we don't know how they affect our behavior. So we try to raise awareness about that. So we know obviously that behavior is influenced by these more conscious or explicit attitudes. These are things that we deliberate about, that we know that we're thinking about. So for example, if I asked you, do you like Pepsi or Coke? You would think about it and you would give me an answer. I think I heard a Pepsi back there. Um, if I asked you, do you like black people and white people the same? You might think, yes, I absolutely, I love everybody. Implicit attitudes, though, are those that are involuntarily formed, so they're given to us by society. They're largely automatic and mostly unconscious. And I want to dispel a myth right off the bat. Implicit attitudes are not your more true attitudes. It's not these gotcha attitudes that everybody thinks they are. These two types of attitudes are equally valid. They're just shaped by different forces and they predict different kinds of behaviors. So it's important to be aware of that. When we talk about implicit attitudes, we usually talk about it as a habit. 
that these are bad habits that can affect our behavior and that we're especially likely to rely on when we're stressed, tired, don't have a lot of time to override our you know, initial unconscious automatic attitudes. So I want to dispel this good person, bad person theory. It's not that some people are good and some people are bad. We are, ex we are all exposed to these ideas, and they are oftentimes very different from what we desire. They can be a bad habit, like biting your fingernails when you're stressed or lighting up a cigarette when you're stressed. And just like any bad habit, awareness and practice can help us overcome it. So let me give you an example. I've been doing this work for a long time, and I believe I have pretty egalitarian attitudes. And then I took an implicit bias test and found that I have implicit biases across the board, unfortunately. I, I tend to, it turns out I tend to prefer white people over black people, implicitly. White people over Latino people, Asian people, even over my own group, Middle Easterners. And it's because I was exposed to these same negative messages growing up in American society that we all were. And so I happened to absorb them. Now, do they have to dictate my behavior? No. Because I believe that when you become aware of them and institute certain strategies, you can override them and they don't have to leak out onto your behavior. So these types of attitudes can impact our behavior before we have a chance to notice them or reflect on them. So this is where the awareness becomes really important. Just to show you how subtle the media can influence our implicit attitudes, these are two uh, newspaper articles from after Hurricane Katrina, and they both portray pretty much the same thing. So the top one is a black person wading through water with some food, and the bottom one is two white individuals wading through water with some food. But importantly, the first one says, a young man walks through chest deep flood water after looting a grocery store. And the bottom one says, two residents wade through chest deep water after finding bread and soda. So even the change of the word looting versus finding, and these aren't the same authors. These are different, but, but there's a consistent message in the way that we talk about various groups, even in our media, that sinks in unbeknownst to us. Um, here are two examples of Sports Illustrated magazine covers, world-class athletes in tennis, but you see the man is portrayed as um, athletic, sort of master of his craft, whereas the woman is very sexualized in line with American stereotypes. Not just that, it starts early. So these are covers of um, children's books. And you can see that the implicit assumption here is that to be a good girl, you should be pretty or gorgeous. To be a good boy, you should be clever or smart. Now, I was, I was talking about this in a workshop one time, and someone raised their hand and said, oh, well, those look like kind of old children's book covers. How old is that? This is from 2012. So because of these messages in society, these, these biases are prevalent. So you can take the, an implicit bias test on the, um, Harvard has a website where you can take it. And over 17 million tests have been administered. And it shows that 70 to 80% of all Americans have an implicit preference for whites over blacks. Not just that, 50% of black Americans have an implicit preference for whites over blacks, over their own group. And again, it, it makes sense once you think about they're exposed to the same messages, negative messages about their group that we all are. It's not just about race. So there's lots of implicit bias tests that can be taken online. And um, one of them is how much do you associate male with career and female with family? Turns out 76% of people make this implicit assumption. 72% of people implicitly associate males with science and females with humanities, or at least not good at math and science. Right. Now, if you're an educator, that's really relevant, 
right? And I have to also check my own implicit biases sometimes as an educator because I want to encourage all of my students to excel in science. 69% of people implicitly prefer thin to overweight people, and 80% of people implicitly prefer the young to the old, including the elderly. So now we're going to take a little break to do a game. This is going to be an interactive game, and here are the rules. You'll see two categories, one on the left and the other on the right. You'll also see words appear on the screen which will either belong to the left category or the right category. Now your job is when you see a word that belongs in the left category, just use your left hand to slap your left thigh. Okay? When you see a word that belongs in the right category, use your right hand to slap your right thigh. Okay, simple enough? Yeah, so everyone put their pencils and purses down. All right, so this first one um, is going to be insects. So if you see spider or gnat, you're going to slap your left thigh. Flowers, daisy, daffodil, you're going to slap your right thigh. Okay? Everybody got it? These are going to go fast, very fast. So if you make a mistake, no worries. Just keep going. And if you miss one, that's okay. The important thing is to just keep going. Okay? Ready? Go. Okay, yes, good job. So how did that go? Pretty easy, pretty straightforward. You got the hang of it? Okay. So now we're going to do the same thing, but you're going to slap your left thigh if it's a bad word, so something like death or evil. Right thigh for a good word like love and peace. Okay? Again, it's going to go fast, but the important thing is to just keep going. Ready? Go. Pretty easy? Okay, so now they're going to be combined, and you're going to slap your left thigh if it's bad or an insect word. So hatred, spider, bo either one, you're going to slap your left thigh. And good or flowers, so love, daffodil, right thigh, either one. Ready? You didn't think you were going to come here and not work, right? <laughs> okay, go. Okay, how was that? A little harder? Wait, wait till you see this one. So, <laughs> so now you're going to slap your left thigh if it's bad or flowers. So death and daisy. Either one, left thigh. Good or insects. So love, spider. Either one, right thigh. Okay? Ready, set, go. So how did that go? Why do you think that was harder? 
So, so a lot of people say that that if the if the good and insect was first, that it would have been easier. Would have been a little bit easier, but it would not have reversed all the difficulty. Does anyone know why? Yeah. Exactly. And where does that association come from? Right, exactly. Very good. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, so obviously it comes from us growing up learning, but most of us learning that insects are bad relative to flowers which are good. Okay? So even that switch doesn't override all the conditioning that society has given you. Okay? Now we'll do it with bad or b stereotypically black names. So, Latanya, Jerome, or bad words, death, hatred. Okay? And then on the right, we're going to do stereotypically white names, Emily, Latanya, and good words, peace, love. Okay? Ready? On your marks, get set, go. Okay? This is your last one, so make it count. So in this last one, we're going to be doing bad words or white names on the left. So Emily or hatred on the left, and good or black words on the right. So love or Latanya on the right thigh. Okay? Last one. Ready? Go. How did that one go? Way easier piece of cake. OK. So for, for anyone, was it maybe harder? Yeah. I got black things on the right correctly. I had the hardest time with some of the words. OK. OK. Now, overall, with all the words, did you find the first one easier or the second one? For how many people did you find the first one easier? Second one. Okay. So for most of us, in fact, 70 to 80% of us, it's easier to do the first one. Can anyone explain why? You have to override. Exactly. You have to override. You, you want to go this way, but then you're like, no, I have to go this way. So the idea behind it is that you are receiving these messages from society of black and bad, white and good, unbeknownst to you. You didn't ask for it, but now they're in your head. And it's easier to do this association than it is when we switch it. So the idea behind implicit bias test is this. The faster you are able to do something, the stronger the association in your head. So these implicit bias tests, like what you can take at Harvard, are just reaction time tests that look very similar to that, where things are popping up on the screen. You have to categorize it. And the, the portion in which we call stereotype compatible, this is where the stereotype is reinforced that you've received from society. That usually is faster. And you subtract it from the other portion where it's switched. And that's the stereotype incompatible portion. And the size of that difference is your implicit bias score. So it's a very simple logic with these implicit bias tests. Okay. All right. So do these actually affect behavior? And it turns out that they do. So explicit or more conscious attitudes predict more explicit behaviors. So these are things like how friendly our words are towards people who we vote for. 
Now, mind you, these things can also be influenced by implicit attitudes, but for the most part, any conscious, deliberate decision is usually more influenced by our explicit attitudes. Implicit attitudes, on the other hand, predict very subtle behaviors. So this is how rapidly we blink, whether we lean forward or back in a conversation, how much eye contact we make, how much we laugh at a joke, how far away we sit from someone. So these are all things that we're not thinking about. But they've actually done these research studies in workplace organizations where they find that people consistently sit a little bit farther away from African Americans than they do from their white coworkers. And it's not very much, it's only a few inches, but it's reliable. Now, that's not just people emitting this implicit bias unconsciously, but the target of the behavior is also picking up on it unconsciously. So after a while, they may think, hmm, you know, I get this weird vibe from this company. I don't know what it is. I can't put my finger on it, but I, I just don't feel welcome here. And so they are picking up on it unconsciously, and it might predict their behavior to leave. So what can we do about it? Well, now that we know what it is, there's lots of implicit bias trainings out there that focus on de-biasing, that, that is just eliminating or reducing implicit bias itself. We don't believe this is very effective because these things are built up over years and are very hard to change, at least in the long term. There's some evidence that you can push them around in the short term, but in the long term, they tend to stay pretty stable. So instead, we focus on bias override. So without actually reducing levels of implicit bias, are there ways that we can override their impact on our behavior? So um, one way is to be aware that they tend to leak out on our behavior most in time-pressed situations, um, when we're tired, so after a long day of work and we, we don't have the cognitive energy to override, or when we don't have the motivation, either because we're not aware or we don't think we're biased. And also, our conscious attitudes do still matter. So, for example, um, I, if I know that I have an implicit bias towards women in my workplace, and I catch on to the fact that I interrupt women more than I interrupt men, I might say, okay, when she's talking, I won't, and stick to that rule. Won't necessarily change my implicit bias, but will stop it from leaking out. So before I go into the effective strategies, I want to first address some ineffective strategies that have been tried. So some people think that you can just suppress the stereotype and not act on it. Um, so this is just try not to stereotype. The problem is, is that once you're tired or you let your guard down at all, the stereotype comes back with a vengeance. So this isn't very effective, it's just to try and will it away. The other one that actually has noble intentions is color blindness. So a lot of organizations I work with actually pride themselves on being color blind. Um, but the issue is, is one, it's not possible to be color blind. We, we physically see color and it's very difficult to ignore it. But the other thing is, even if it was possible, it's not desirable. Because um, color blindness is this idea that I work with this African-American, I'm not gonna see that he's black, I'm just gonna see that he's a fellow employee. Well, when I do that, I'm denying a very important part of his identity. People take pride in their ethnic identities or any type of identity, and to say that we don't want you talking about it, we're not gonna focus on it, is to say that it's not important. And so um, organizations that have tried to implement colorblind ideology actually, um, have employees that are less engaged, less productive, less creative. And also, it, it makes racial tensions worse, if you can believe it. Because even if we could deny that we see color explicitly, our implicit biases are still running rampant. Okay. Here's a quote from a woman in the Atlantic. She said, you can't have people saying they don't see color. I'm, bl I'm a black woman, and if you're telling me you don't see color, you're telling me you don't see the injustices that I faced, the struggles that I have, and you definitely can't celebrate my culture. 
So what are the more effective strategies? Well, research has shown that you can make some headway in reducing the impact of implicit bias using five strategies. The first one is stereotype replacement. So this is when I feel, when I detect that I've relied on a stereotype, I can reflect on where that came from and how it affected my students or my colleagues or my family and I can replace it with a non-stereotypic thought. So I, I reflect, okay, where did I get this idea? Why did I get this idea that I could interrupt women but not men? And how may that have affected other colleagues that I've worked with? And let me replace it with an, an, a non-stereotypic idea that women are just as competent as men. Situational explanations, so this is very important. Um, stereotypes are insidious because they offer a, our brain an easy time and energy saving device, right? I'm not gonna spend a lot of time paying attention to what's going on in your situation. I'm just gonna say it's something about you. So for example, if somebody cuts me off in traffic, I might think, oh, what a jerk. But if I were to just take a second and pay attention to what's going on, I might have realized that somebody cut him off in traffic, so he had to cut me off to avoid an accident. So a lot of times we can make more accurate explanations of the behavior by taking into account the situational forces that are acting on the person and not just jumping to their personality. The third strategy is individuating. So stereotyping is basically just generalizing that you are the same as your group. So again, this takes more cognitive time and energy, but sometimes spending that time and energy is worth it. So this is taking the extra step to ask more questions about an individual, get to know them for who they are. Maybe I have a student who's underperforming in my class and I might think, well, they're just lazy, like their group. Well, maybe if I asked a few more questions, I would understand that you know, they're having a difficult time at home or they have a learning disability and need extra accommodations, right? So I wanna get to know them as a person. Perspective taking, so trying to imagine what it may feel like to live life prejudged as lazy, unintelligent, or potentially violent all on the basis of your race. This can really help us emotionally connect with people, which then reinforces the other strategies like situational explanations. And lastly, increasing opportunities for contact. So, you know, sometimes it's difficult to seek out situations where you might have more interaction with minority groups, um, especially if you live in an area where minority groups aren't particularly represented. And so this might take a little a bit of, again, time and energy to join particular clubs or to go to particular events or festivals where you might come across more diversity, but it can be worth it because you can meet people who disconfirm the stereotypes. And now you're introducing yourself to a new society. Okay. You can also modify your own visual environment by watching movies, TV, or news that portray minorities in non-stereotypic ways. So remember, I said one of the sources of implicit bias was media. So you can change your media and select your own environment to, to pay attention to. Um, now, of course, we can't change everything about society, but um, a lot of my a lot of my work focuses on the individual level, but clearly there are things that the systems or entire organizations can do to make it harder for implicit biases to affect people. So um, equitable, equitable policies and culture. So a lot of organizations like to take a second look at their maternity leave policy or equal pay for men and women or even things like policies enacted to reduce discretion. So the blind auditions, for example, that was an organizational decision to say, we're not even gonna let your implicit biases have a chance to leak out, we're just gonna keep everything blind. Um, another strategy is, uh, is deciding criteria in advance. 
So research has shown that hiring practices, for example, um, go much smoother and are much more representative of all groups when you decide your criteria in advance and stick to it. That way you're not making decisions about candidates on the fly, about how your gut feels, right? And it pays off for the bottom line. So uh, research has shown that companies in the top quartile for racial and ethnic diversity are 35% more likely to outperform their respective national industry medians. And companies in the top quartile for gender diversity are 15% more likely to outperform their respective national industry medians. So diversity is good, but there has to be change on a systems level as well. I, I'm a psychologist, so I tend to focus more on the, in, the things the individual can do, but certainly that doesn't mean that there isn't work to be done on a societal level to combat these injustices. In terms of blind procedures, I do this on myself sometimes. So I know naturally I'm gonna have positive dispositions towards certain students in my class versus others. Maybe they work in my research lab, maybe they show up to my talks, right? And I, I know I have these positive predispositions toward them, but I don't want that to leak into my grading. I certainly don't want my negative predispositions to leak out into my grading. So what I've decided to do now is whenever my students take a test, I have them put their name on the front page and they write all their essays on the last page. So that way I flip them all before I grade them and I just grade blindly. So I'm not allowing my own biases to take effect and organizations can do this in various capacities as well. Cooperative inter interdependence, which means that focusing on common goals, so it turns out when mixed race groups work together, that can reduce both explicit and implicit biases, especially if it's a positive outcome after they work together. And also, just for organizations to recognize the role of time and ability. So um, some police departments in, um, I think, Las Vegas or other, other places have actually decided that in um, police chase pursuits, um, the person who is chasing the, the citizen um, cannot be the one to arrest them. It has to be somebody else. They have to call for backup. Someone has to detain them other than the person who chased. Why? Because your adrenaline is going, you've had this stress on you, and a lot of times that can lead to excessive force. And so they have decided then to have somebody else do it to avert the issue. So this is what I mean by policy changes that can um, avoid negative outcomes. So I'd just like to end uh, with this quote by Brian Marks at Morehouse College who said, we're all biased, but the consequences of our bias depends on the role we play in society. And I'd like to leave you with a question, what role do you play? Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? Yes. Uh, I thank you very much for the uh, clarification. Uh, look at me. I'm a brown person. And I am a victim of this. I have a, a UCLA and UC Berkeley uh, master's degree in anthropology. I came to um, Santa Barbara. I left my job at the Defense Language Institute. I was a senior instructor for the Marines and the Special Forces going to Iraq, Iraq and Afghanistan. Now, I was waiting for a friend of mine in State Street, I just wearing a t-shirt, and there was a group of women going to the Getty. One of them came to me and said, are you going to the Getty? And I said, I work there. And she looked at me, looked at my t-shirt, you are a parking attendant? <laughs> okay. This lady, two weeks later, I attended a women uh, meeting, and one by one of the lead, a leader, a leadership in women come up, and she is the fifth woman who said, I was a perking at then. I said, what? She is a leader in a community? And as you explained, that some people don't have the time to process. And I said, that's okay. Another happening in, in the library. I came to check out um, 
a book, Kafka, a philosopher. They don't have that. I came down, stop, stop to me. And I saw all the white people going out. Nobody stopped them. I was stopped. My bag was searched. I said, what? This is a violation. And they say, somebody stole a cassette. Me? I'm the only brown person there. The white people go out, and I am the one that stole a cassette. And I said, and you don't know who I am. I work with the Defense Department. I have a clearance from FBI and CIA. I have no felony. And you dare to do this to me. And I wrote a letter to the director, no response. So it happened again and again, and I'm sometimes, I'm just human being. I feel like you, I have to walk away from this and give them, oh, maybe because they have not the time. To, this again in the, in the library, it's something else. But let me see something here. I'm going to read a poem. And this is another thing. Fallen dreams. It begins as a child alone in bed in a room full of night. The crickets sing. The smell of cinnamon in a cup of tea put me adrift in dreams, sailing to the fast Indian Ocean to America. So as a child, I was dreaming about coming to America. Years have passed. I'm awakened out of my dreams. California lights up my world. Yet something has emerged, the stirring pain deep in my heart. I climb the hill on Summerland, stand at the garden, listen to voices of my grandchildren, flow out the window in a home where two families, brown and white, find a bond on a breakfast table. Who can understand or question what a brown grandmother is like standing for years uninvited outside the door of my son's home, uninvited to my son's and grandchildren's birthdays, listen to the longing inside my heart to the family occasion. I cannot be long. No one question how I feel. I'm winging my way alone in America, helping the homeless veterans and the homeless youth, faces that light up, the only one that touch my heart. So this happened to my family. My son married a white woman, and my son said, in America you have the law, is that you just cannot come into my house without uh, permission or something like that. You know, we, we have the privacy. So I said, you know, how long can I be outside the door, right? Because this is privacy. So, and the privacy becomes like a long time. And, and, uh, it, it is just occasionally because this is a privacy in America, and it is the law. And anyway, I went to a very uh, retired a lawyer. I said, is this really the law in America? And he said, Mira, yes, yes. And then he, he looked at me with such sadness in his eyes, and he said, what, what can I do? Well, he said, uh, do you have any other interest in life? I said, I'm a poet, I'm a writer, I'm a photographer. Just do that. And yesterday I met him and he had given me that big smile. As I said to him, thank you so much. And he really touched my heart because there's so much love and he understand my feeling. But this is what the law is, you know, privacy in, 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 
and you come from a third world country, the Philippines or the Indonesian, and you always are included in a family. And suddenly now it's a privacy. So that's, I, I try to understand this, but it comes again and again and again in the library. The woman he said, I'm a, I'm a, you know, but you see, I, 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 I help people. I help, I help the youth, the homeless youth. I help uh, the veterans, and that's my heart. When, when they left for Iraq and Afghanistan, many of them were foster boys, boys that were given up by their parents the fifth day they were born. And they have the same dreams, just like my dreams, going to university, but they die there before they even go to university. And that's why I'm on the street all the time, feeding homeless youth, homeless veterans, because that's what my heart is. And that is where I feel that love for people comes deep from my heart. I mean, whatever people do to me, that's not my problem. But I feel life is limited. I like to be productive, helping surface to me is joyful, and that is what I'm doing. Thank you. What was your name? Mira. Mira, thank you for that very touching story. Any other questions? Yeah, in the back. Oh, I wouldn't be surprised if it happened for a long enough time that you would see the same activation of some of these symptoms with PTSD because, you know, PTSD is, is a reaction to a trauma. So if the event is perceived as a trauma, particularly if it happens um, to one person repeatedly, um, it, it very well could become a trauma to where they might have a reaction like PTSD. I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, certainly it's a case-by-case -case basis, but I wouldn't be surprised. Mm -hmm. I'm guessing also the amygdala, uh, mm -hmm. fear processing, and then uh, the hippocampus, mm -hmm. uh, emotional memory. Mm -hmm. How much, uh, I guess, research is there showing the relationship of those regions of the brain and, and also making these implicit bias? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the best research has really shown associations between um, the medial prefrontal cortex, but also certainly the amygdala, because that's the emotion center of the brain. So when we have emotional reactions towards people, it's certainly going to recruit the amygdala as well. Um, because these are not just associations. They're not like cold cognitive associations. These are feelings that we have about people. Um, so it absolutely will recruit the amygdala. Yeah. Um, I'll put it this way, the, the tendency to uh, distinguish groups of people and slap trait labels onto these groups of people is innate. The content of what those traits and people associations are is cultural. It's environmental. So we all have a tendency to create biases, but what those biases are are really up to our society. Yeah. Yes, Forrest. Mm. It's a great question. Um, so the research has come a long way, but I would not say that, you know, just giving someone an implicit bias test is enough to use in what we call selection context. So, you know, to decide whether someone is fit to be a, a jury member or a police officer or a probation officer or a teacher. Um, because every behavior is... Um, 
is affected by a lot of different things, one of which is implicit bias. And so I don't think that it's fair necessarily to hold against a person something that's only one aspect of their behavior and they may not even know they have. Um, so it's, it's kind of the reason why people start, stopped using intelligence tests or personality tests in certain organizations to hire people because, again, it's, it's something that should be, you know, a hiring decision should be based on somebody's qualifications and experience. Not that those things aren't important, but the fact that you don't have control over them should best be addressed by diversity training or making people aware. I don't think it's necessarily fair to have it be um, factoring into a decision about their livelihood. In some ways, there's some self-selection. The person describing themselves says, I am not biased, so I can hold these biases at bay. Mm -hmm. And so what does it mean for either myself as a potential juror right. or an attorney, district attorney, yeah. public defender? Right. Well, some psychologists serve as trial consultants in which they provide implicit bias training to juries, especially jur juries that have a race factor. And so sometimes there can be some small training that goes on. Um, again, I, 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 it's an important question. I think people should be aware of this issue because it affects people's lives, not just their livelihoods, but their lives. Um, but again, I think in and of itself it's not enough and we, best, we would be best to address it with training. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I mean, uh, go ahead. Right now, I employ quite a few Mexicans, and I find that there, is, there are Mexicans in Santa Barbara who are what we call Chilangos. They come from Mexico City, and they carry authority somehow or another. Just, uh, the other Mexican, when they speak, the other Mexicans listen to them. Yeah, I mean, you know, in today's world, we come across lots of different groups of people, and unlike in an evolutionary context, they may, they may hurt us, they may harm us, but we don't know based on their group membership. So I think the point is, is to be aware that these messages may affect our decisions. Any other questions? Yes? Yeah, no problem. Uh -huh. What's the effectiveness of that in terms of focusing on merits of diversity as opposed to focusing even on uh, suffering or unique relationships, stuff like just focusing on the positive merits? What's the effectiveness of empathy training? Yeah, uh, very effective. It goes by different names. So uh, it could be, you know, diversity training, multicultural training, empathy training. But the, I think. Well, it comes in different forms, too. So implicit bias is one training. Another training is to combat colorblindness. So the, the, the approach that they suggest to use instead of colorblindness is called multiculturalism. And it's basically the opposite of colorblindness. So you not only acknowledge people's ethnic identities, but you celebrate it. Um, so you do things to actually allow people to engage using their identities because that's an important part of them and to respect people's differences. So I think that's what you mean by merit. What, uh, Mark is telling me one more question. So did you have a question in the back? Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. I think that affirmative action is um, was a policy that was in a political realm. Um, and so it's a very political issue, very multifaceted political issue. Um, in, it, when I talked about the orchestra study, it's not that there was a certain quota for women. It was just that women were given the opportunity to show their merit without the obstacle in the way of being a woman. Um, 
I think affirmative action is a little bit different from that in that there tends to be quotas. And so I don't want to speak too much to that because that would really be a political science question. Um, but I do want to say that I think that practices that reduce discretion in a way to allow the most qualified candidates to show themselves without the historical, sociological, cultural barriers that they carry as a burden is always beneficial. So I would, I would rather steer towards those kinds of policies. Thank you. Carmel. Thank you. Thank you.